can be overcome. We'll also have a short presentation on the work that the OECD is carrying out in this area. And we'll be conducting two audience polls where we will ask you first, is there sufficient evidence that the circular economy will bring significant economic benefits? And secondly, we'll seek your views on the policy approaches you think are most effective to promote the transition to a circular economy. And we'll be asking these polls just before the start of the panel. You'll have one minute to answer. The results will then be shown on the screen so that the panelists will be aware of your views. So I hope you're ready with your apps to answer those questions. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be your moderator uh, for this session. I'm Brendan Gillespie. I've been working on a wide variety of environmental issues for more than 40 years. Uh, for most of that time uh, in the Environment Directorate of the OECD and in the last couple of years as a partner in a consulting firm, Green Solutions Network. So turning to the first panel, uh, the macroeconomic impact of the circular economy, um, there have been a number of studies that have been carried out on this subject, and they generally suggest that the circular economy can boost output and GDP and generate new jobs. And some of these studies uh, suggest that the economic impacts can be very large. For example, one study by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation suggested that the transition to a circular economy could boost European GDP by 11% by 2030 and 27% by 2050. Now, some economists have argued that these studies tend to overestimate the economic benefits because they don't pay sufficient attention to the obstacles and the costs required to achieve the benefits. On the other hand, some economists argue that these models underestimate the benefits because, for example, they don't take sufficient account of the environmental benefits in the transition to a circular economy. So, to, uh, to help us make sense of these studies, uh, we have four panelists, uh, and I would ask them to, uh, 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 to answer three questions. <clears throat> the first is, um, yes, it's on the basis of the existing studies, is there sufficient evidence that the circular economy will bring significant economic benefits? And that's the, the first question for the audience poll. And perhaps I could invite you now uh, to go to the app and to answer that question, yes or no. And before the start of the panel, we'll see the results. The second question uh, for the panelists is, is the circular economy going to lead to a net increase in employment? We know that the transition to the circular economy will create some jobs but it will also destroy others. And what we're interested in is what the net employment effect will be. And thirdly, um, if there are benefits in the transition to a circular economy, how will they be distributed? And not just the benefits, but also the costs. Who will be the winners and losers in the transition to a circular economy, both in the, both in the domestic economy, but also internationally? So with that, I'd like to um, invite the speakers to um, uh, speak. Um, but, but, but prior to that, we uh, are going to get the results of the audience poll. So I'd ask our technical assistants to help us here. So is there sufficient evidence that circular economy will bring sufficient economic benefits? Yes, 40. 243, no 57, which I'm somewhat surprised by. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for that feedback. I think it provides a very interesting backdrop. So, I'd like to start by inviting the first of the panelists, Professor Paul Eakins, who's the Professor of Resources and Environmental Policy and Director of the Institute for Sustainable Resources at University College London. And Paul also works closely with UNEP's International Resource Panel and oversaw the preparation of a recent review of the economics of resource efficiency. So I think he's in an excellent position to kick off our discussion. Paul. Well, thank you very much, Brendan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would certainly have voted no. Um, so that's uh, put my cards on the table. And of course, with a question like this, uh, it's a complicated question, and there are many ifs and buts to do with it. Um, my, my first if and but is to say, well, compared to what and when? 
And the easy question, the easy answer to that question is to look at 2050 and assume that we consider, uh, to, to assume that we continue on the same trajectory that we're on now. Um, we finished a European research project uh, some uh, 18 months ago, and we actually tried to model that. Uh, everyone, 9 billion people, resource use, same resource use per head as uh, in rich countries at the moment. And that future is a nightmare. It is a nightmare because there are huge price volatilities, especially to do with food. There are obviously water shortages. There are enormous uh, blockages uh, in uh, resource supply chains. Uh, investment doesn't come along at the right time. It is not a world any of us would want to live in. And it certainly has lower output and fewer jobs uh, than uh, we can get from the circular economy. So that's the easy answer. That's a world we really do not want to go, and I'm sure one of the reasons we're here is because we recognize that. Much more difficult answer is what will be the economic implications compared to now? And that's, of course, the answer that policymakers are really interested in because they don't have a 2050 timescale, most of them. They have a five-year timescale and they want to be re-elected at the end of that five years, and unemployment and recession is bad for their re-election prospects. And that's the really interesting question. What is the evidence? Well, we have, we've heard lots of evidence over the last two days that resource efficiency can save costs. But it's also my conviction that these cost savings on an adequate scale will not come about by themselves. They need policy. Policy will need to unlock those cost savings. Obviously, governments working with businesses rather than against them, but those policies are critical. And those model runs that show macroeconomic gains from resource efficiency have done so because they've adopted specific kinds of policies. The second issue is to do with innovation. And this, of course, is very uncertain. It's a major theme of this conference. Innovation can find solutions that currently do not exist and can reduce costs where they currently seem quite high. This is not speculation. You've only got to see, have a look and see what's happened to renewable energy over the last five to ten years. Cost reductions that people like me would not have believed possible have actually occurred. And we're seeing now auctions for solar photovoltaics for 30 pounds a megawatt hour, 30 euros a megawatt hour in different parts of the world. This is simply extraordinary. So if we can stimulate an innovation process that can achieve those kinds of cost reductions and those kinds of solutions towards a circular economy, towards resource efficiency, then we can get both business and macroeconomic benefits. But again, that will not happen by itself. We will need smart policies in order to achieve that. Now, the next session is going to talk in much more detail about these policies. What I'm going to say is that what I've heard here, I've heard two things which are the nub of the problem of resource efficiency. The first is that the resource efficient solution is often not the economically efficient solution. And that was the major finding of this IRP report, which I had the privilege of being the lead author of. So we have to find a way of rebalancing those costs. Specifically, materials are too cheap and too cheap to dispose of, and labor is too expensive to be employed in that process. And that is the nub of the policy problem. We can address that problem through the fiscal system, but we know that policymakers find taxes and everything like that very tricky to implement. Finland, interestingly, because I've spent most of my academic life looking at environmental fiscal reform, Finland was the first country to introduce a carbon tax. And could be in a position to lead this movement. But unless we find a way of making 
materials and their disposal relatively more expensive and more valuable, and labor relatively cheaper, we are going to find it extremely difficult, even with all the other policies at our disposal, to make a real difference to this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I think that's, a, that's an excellent start to our discussion. Um, now, I'd like to move on to uh, invite Mr. Venkata Shalam Ambum, Ambum Oji, Senior Economist at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, which is based in Jakarta, Indonesia. You may sit there or come to the podium as you wish. Yeah, good morning. And, uh... Thank you very much. And uh, I'm coming from the region that is the, which is very dynamic and which is growing very fast. So the circular economy, the concept, that is the concept of uh, future for today is very, very relevant to uh, emerging economies of Asia in the Pacific. Why I'm saying, and there are evidences actually that is uh, just last year we produced this report towards the circular economy for Asia Pacific. Uh, this is based on the very rigorous economic analysis, and we found that is uh, adopting the circular economic principles can lead into a kind of a new economic growth, basically, for the future. And we calculated this value could be about 624 billion for 10 ASEAN countries, small and medium-sized economies. How it comes? Basically, we selected three sectors. One is that is the cities, Second thing is the manufacturing. Third one is the agriculture and forestry. We calculated how much resource efficiency could be applied. We can gain from it. How much uh, jobs could be created. And um, third one is that is the avoided uh, uh, environmental pollution which has the health implications. We, this region is also spending a lot of money for hazardous waste. If we, if we adopt this circular economy principles, we also calculated about 10.5 million jobs could be created in these three sectors. This is based on the very rigorous modeling analysis, and also there is also taking into account some of the ongoing policy measures. For example, like Finland and the Japan, Japan is also one of the forest indents countries. So in 1989, they introduced a law for incineration, stopping that incineration. It was legally banned. Then the business and the local communities who are using these uh, forest ways, they need to think about it. They, bought, they, they found a collaboration with the local community and the academia, and they found development kind of new industries. These new industries could be able to transform this forest waste into energy stream and also a material stream. That created about 11,000 jobs within a small province. So these impacts of these circular economies are very vivid. It could be upscaled with the policy instruments. At present, these regulations and the standards are not very valid, or it is not very stringent in the emerging economies of the Asia Pacific. So we need to look into it, and we need to devise the policies that bring much more social benefits. That is where that is the niche comes in. How we can maximize the social benefits and the environmental benefits that could be translated into these economic uh, benefits. Third thing, uh, the second thing I want to main, mention about the jobs. I think it's all about the jobs, but it varies. It is a very complex situation. And it is to the job creation has to be seen at the three levels. One is at the meso level, at the sector level, economic level. And second thing is the meso level, basically at the region wise. And third one is at the micro level, at the, at the small farm level or at the household level. Here we find the difficulties and there is always a trade-off. There is, will be a, some new jobs will be created and some, some jobs will be lost and some jobs will be renamed if we adopt all these three principles of uh, circular economy. Here we need to be very cautious on how we are going to compensate for the losers. Particularly as happened in the case of Japan, actually when they uh, banned incineration, and then there are about uh, 
uh, 12 plants has lost it, the, the jobs. Then, but this, this uh, economy was so absorbent and they, they could be able to absorb them with a the new skill development. So this circular economy could be twinned with these uh, new policy innovations that comes up. Third thing I would like to mention about the policy coherence. If we implement and if we attain the maximum benefits, and we should not look into that only that environmental policies. It has to be twinned with the other policies, other economic instruments, whether the microeconomic policies, or the tax policies, or the trade policies. Actually, one of the best examples, the region that is I represent here is the emerging economy of Asia. This region has benefited from the economic integration because their new prosperity come from this economic integration. At the same time, the policy instruments has not been so coherent. And here we need to find a policies, integrated policy work frameworks to promote this circular economy that can maximize the potentials of the economic benefit, environmental benefit, and the social benefit. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Amber Moji. Um, and it's, I think, interesting that you started to broaden the discussion beyond just the benefits and costs, but to the distributional aspects, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, next, I'd like to invite Professor Anna Hutala, who's the Director General of the VAT Institute for Economic Research here in Finland. Thank you. I prefer sitting here so that I can... We can move on then with the discussion. So, um, as a researcher, and, and, and uh, I'm economist by training, I sympathize very much for your vote, because it's, for me it's too early to tell what the uh, benefits of circular economy will be. To start with how we define circular economy, that's an important question. And then uh, also if we understand that if we talk about economy-wide benefits, we start perhaps from the firm level, but then little by little we should aggregate the, the, the national accounts. And we know that when we talk about growth and, and GDP growth, it's, it's not a measure that, that's complete and tells about the benefits to the society, no matter what the economic issue is. So there are immense problems if you take seriously this word evidence about what the benefits will be. So, but I guess that my uh, main point is that, that what will show us whether there will be benefits or not depends very much on the consumers. Because when we talk about circular economy, we talk about scarcity of resources and environmental degradation. And in the very end, I think in market economies, it's consumers who decide whether they are willing to pay pay for the environmental uh, improvements and at least not for harming environmental more than is, is necessary. So uh, that's about my thoughts about benefits. Um, regarding employment, I guess that in, in media, economists often discuss about uh, unemployment rates and, and these macro numbers that, that everybody is familiar with if, if, if you read new newspapers. But uh, regarding employment, uh, I think the economists think it's, it's not an important indicator at all. Of course, it's important for uh, public finances and um, public sector if their unemployment rate is high, of course it's a concern. But from economist point of view, we are concerned about well-being of people. Then we understand that people also appreciate leisure time. Employment per se and, and working is not an, it's, it's part of your well-being, but that's not the only one. And I just wanted to take this up because so often uh, we economists are blamed for that, that we, we are so harsh and then we don't care about people's well-being. We, we just look at the hard numbers. But that, that's not very true. And, and, and regarding whether we will have more employment uh, thanks to circular economy, that's an issue that we have to evaluate whether they are meaningful work that, that uh, people are doing. 
And then we take it as a given that whether it's government sector or firms, they employ the people that they, they need and, and, and that's how economy is working. So employment per se is not the goal for uh, um, well-being. I know that this is provocative, but, but I, I want to take this up as well. And finally, regarding this, whether there are gainers and losers uh, in circular economy, of course there are. And um, I can tell you about those I would like to see benefiting from circular economy. A uh, couple of years ago, here in Helsinki, in our Museum of Contemporary Art, there was a photogra photograph uh, exhibition about um, um, children um, working in, in developing countries. And then there were very touchy pictures about those young kids. Uh, I don't remember, but it was an African country, and they were working in a landfill, and they were sorting this electronic waste that has mm. been exported there. Mm. And these little kids, they were trying to find something valuable from this burning landfill in an environment that, that's as unhealthy as you ever can imagine. So I hope that if we take seriously environmental issues and, and, and part of the economy, I, I think that those are the groups uh, of people that, that should gain and not that uh, we again talk about uh, green consumerism and, and well-being of, of consumers in rich countries where we can have status good when, when we are ecological consumers. These are the two extremes that, that they exist and, and, and um, you can understand why, why our concern should be on, on, on the side where we really see serious environmental problems nowadays. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hutela. And now we come to the fourth panelist, uh, Professor Bing Zhu from Tsinghua University in China. The floor okay. is yours. Thank you, Chair. I also prefer to sit, speak here. So about the first question, my, my answer is yes. I want to first emphasize that second economy da, da, does not, I would say, simply you know, uh, pursue economic benefits. It does bring significant economic benefit, but, that, but that's not all we care about. I think as everyone here we know, in contrast to the, how to say, the linear, linear economy, the second economy aims to internalize the social and environmental externality, thereby bringing both of economic and environmental benefits. It promotes sustainable development by establishing a new model, integrates economic, social, and environmental aspects in a harmonious way. So please allow me to say a few words about the situation in China. So as a developing country, China is undergoing rapid industrialization. It's aimed, it's aimed to achieve sustainable development by supporting circular economy and transforming our economic mode. So let me give you some number. In 20, 2016, China recycled 151 million tons of iron steel and 9.8 million tons of non ferro metals, 18.8 .8 million tons of plastic, 49.8 million tons of paper, and 18.6 18, million tons of glass. The total production value of the re resource recycling sector was approximately, I think, 260 billion US, do US dollar. We will see the producing very remarkable economic benefits. In the meantime, in a result of this resource recycling, the consumption of raw material was reduced by approximately 1.2 billion tons, thereby significantly mitigating the negative environmental impacts. So I believe with the people's increasing how to say, attention on environment and development, the cost of the pollution 
environmental damage as well as resource extraction will be higher and higher. And the economic benefits of circular economy will only become more and more remarkable. About the second question, we, we will say we pay attention to this issue, but uh, we don't have this moment, we don't, we, don't, how do say, we don't have the full assessment. I cannot answer yes or no about if there's a net increase exists. However, I think two things are clear and uh, important. First, the transformation of a linear economy to a circular one will create a new sector that connects production and utilization in the reverse, in the reverse order. This new sector will mainly include such reverse cycle train activities, such as reuse and remanufacture, recycling, and so on. To have such a new sector established, capital investment is required. That provides, I think, uh, uh, that will drive economic growth. However, this sector, or moreover, I, this sector will create a large number of jobs. I give you a number. According to the Ministry of Commerce of China, so there are approximately 15 billion people engaged in resource recycling. I think this makes sense. And secondly, I would say the jobs created by the circular economy are usually more labor intensive. The major reason is that such jobs do not have a high level of capital or, tech or technology substitutability. I just uh, give you an example for the remanufacturer. For example, for one Chinese engine manufacturer, it uh, requires about uh, 200 workers to manufacture 20,000 new outer engine a year, but it needs 400 workers to remanufacture the same amount of the engine a year. So, of course, it's very complex to, to predict the, the net in, changes in employment. Jobs may be gained in some sector, meanwhile may be lost in some other sectors. I will also say the changes in resource taxes and the labor tax, tax will also have significant impact on employment. Actually, we are actively paying attention and also would like to study on that. About the third question, so about the winner and the loser. So, I would say the key issue is how to define winner and the loser. As I said earlier, so the circular economy has a dual objective pursuit, both environmental and economic benefits. From a perspective of environment, I think the circular economy contributes to the environmental improvement. Therefore, I think everyone in the society, in the society is a direct beneficiary. For, from an uh, economic benefit perspective, there will be indeed some losers in the short run. Some traditional sectors will be impacted for sure, such as mining, traditional materials, and uh, the parts processing and manufacturing and the land fuel. And some people will lose jobs for sure. And this requires government to play its due role by developing appropriate policy in order to turn losers into winners. So due to construct, construct, I just uh, give you a very short example from China. So for example, in order to transform and upgrade iron steel into China is phasing out the overcapacity. That's a technological backward and environmentally damaging. Many enterprises need to cut production and consequently some job will be lost. Therefore, the Chinese government has allocated so-called special award or compensation fund to leverage more financial support for such industrial transformation and upgrading. For the workers who have lost their jobs, the government encourages the enterprise to offer alternative jobs or provide professional training for new jobs or make some proper pension arrangement for elderly workers to retire early. And this could be make, I think, the, the things more stable. So I should also add that the second economy itself and as it does create many commercial opportunities that could, I think, provide many new jobs for those who have lost their job. I think to summarize, the second economy contributes to the resource efficiency, environment improvement, and more economic progress 
and potentially can achieve the parental improvement. In other words, everybody could be benefit. Finally, please allow me to say, so I, think, so I think two months before, our president, Chinese president Xi Jinping, you know, visited Finland. So the agreement between the Finland and China, there are some priority for cooperation. I think one of the priorities is the circular economy and uh, resource efficient. I think international cooperation in this field is extremely important. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the panel very much for these four very interesting presentations. And it seems to me that one of the main emerging conclusions is that there are potentially important benefits in the transition to a circular economy, but they're not going to be generated automatically by the market. They, they require government intervention. And in the second panel, we'll be exploring what some of these policy approaches might be, and we've heard some of them already. Um, but I, I think the question I'd like to put then to the panel, because this uh, session is about the um, circular economy and research, uh, the economic research into the circular economy, if we are to really motivate politicians and policymakers to strengthen their policies in this area, what type of additional research do you think would be most helpful to um, provide them with the evidence uh, that we need to move in that direction? Yeah, would anybody like to take that, Paul? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question, and it's a very difficult one. I mean, the, the traditional answer to a question like that is that you have to model this stuff. It's very complicated. Macroeconomic models uh, vary widely in type, and they vary even more widely in the kinds of assumptions that are made about them. And very often, the results that macroeconomic models generate uh, are little more than a, are playing out of the assumptions that went into them in the beginning. Um, but the, the one thing we know is that uh, any model based on past experience is unlikely to be a very good guide to the future because we're going to have to have new working patterns, new business models, a lot of innovation, uh, restructuring of whole sectors, and models find that extremely difficult, not to say impossible, to take account of. But, but I think it's, at the macroeconomic level, it's more or less the only set of tools we have. Um, we're trying to do our, our bit in, uh, in, in UCL. Um, there are a number of modeling groups around the world that are really grappling with this problem and coming up with interesting results. They won't generate the truth, but they might help us think about the problem, and they might give us insights into the kind of policies that we will need to implement in order to make it more or less likely to generate the economic benefits that we all hope will arrive from the circular economy. Okay, thank you. Yes? I think that policymakers still are <laughs> lacking enough evidence for how much it costs to harm the environment, so that, that uh, economies should provide information about what the benefits are not in terms of monetary terms, because that's the hardship, so that, that uh, much of the environmental degradation um, is not shown in, uh, in, in market prices. And then for that pur purpose, we need government intervention of, from policymakers, and then showing that, that it costs to not to care about environment. That's one thing. And Another thing is that what are the concrete policy instruments, and that's the topic of the next <clears throat> session, so that, that oftentimes very concrete uh, hierarchies that which instruments should be used and, and, and in what kind of environmental problems. Because my idea is that that circular economy will not start working if we do not internalize these externalities as we talk about uh, environmental problems about. So that's how it started. And, and, and when we get the market economy right in terms of prices, then uh, we have the proper incentives uh, so that, that uh, the circular economy is possible. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, just two points that just came to my mind, and um, this is also very practical. and. Um, 
Uh, one thing is that the circular economy is already on the move, and um, the concepts, particularly from the Asia-Pacific region. But these are the very patchy networks, and uh, very patchy. And uh, here, one thing we need to study, and uh, under what conditions these models, the circular economy models, came up, and how it could be upscaled at the national level. This is the area that is basically, our research is trying to focus on this one. First one is that is what's happening in the field and how it could be upscaled. Second thing is operationalizing the concept of um, circular economy. I think here we need a huge uh, knowledge inputs from the research community. Uh, these things could be seen at the three different levels. I think at the macro level, at the meso level, and at the farm level, at the micro level. But all these things need two things, I think, uh, uh, apart from the policies, you need a technology and you need a finance. These two things have to be combined together and these two windows have to be opened together. How we can do it and what policies can help and how to involve the private sector. And these are the two, three areas that, is, that need immediate research. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. So I have two points to add, even though it might be not economic uh, perspective. So first I would say maybe we should pay attention for the difference, for example, for the advanced economy or developing economy or, the, for example, emerging economy. So for the different stage of economic development. Second point I would say now there are quite many different concepts, such as the circular economy, green economy, low carbon economy. I think, uh, uh, how to say, the evaluation indicator system for, uh, for the, to evaluate the circular economy is very important, no matter, I mean, from the policy side or from economic research side. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, perhaps one further question in, in this area of research. We've uh, seen how the distributional impacts can be an important, um, important impediment. Um, from, from my kind of review of the literature, I find the analysis of this is not very strong. I mean, there are a few odd case studies here and there that it's difficult to generalize from. I mean, is there any more that could be done to, to get better insights into how this question of winners and losers, both domestically but also internationally, and we've seen, you know, last week, Mr. Trump's, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, fundamental opposition or you know, rationale for withdrawing from the Paris Agreement was the distributional impacts on his country. Um, I mean, is there any, you know, more work that could be done to get better insights into distributional impacts and also the policies that can help to alleviate uh, the, um, uh, uh, the adverse impacts on affected groups? Um, I mean, perhaps I can start on that. Um, yes, obviously, there's lots more work that can and probably needs to be done. But at the same time, uh, the political problem is that the losers uh, know or imagine they're going to be losers and very often they're well entrenched and incumbent, whereas the winners think they might be winners, but they realize there are lots of ifs and buts on the way and they are not incumbents almost by definition. And therefore you have a very uh, unbalanced political economy around that discussion. That's been one of the problems with taking forward the environmental tax reform agenda. It is always possible with environmental tax reform to um, compensate the losers, especially when they are uh, low income, relatively low income and disadvantaged households. It's just that administratively it can be quite complex and that uh, what, whatever the, the, the winners may say about social justice, uh, they, they don't like having some of their winnings taken away from them in order to compensate, uh, in order to compensate the losers. So the political economy of this stuff is really difficult and researchers can play a role in showing what is possible and a lot of us have done a lot of that over the years but we can't resolve the political problems of actually implementing it sure okay thank you yeah and yes. uh, yeah go ahead of course uh, that is the it is a circular economy and implementing the circular economy is a game and it could be a game changer also i think uh, so in that process it is normal to have the uh, winners and the losers. But the question is uh, how we are going to compensate for the losers. 
then here actually we need to we need to do more that is uh, to identify who are the winners and the losers and uh, our empirical analysis indicate that is the winners could be these uh, leading mncs uh, multinational companies and also this uh, the first tier small and medium enterprises who are fit into the global value chain Coming to the losers, and as I mentioned by Professor, and these uh, low-income households and the uh, SMEs are the micro-enterprises that is not the part of the global value chain. So here we, and also there is an informal sector, and if you go to the countries like India and Brazil and China, and uh, we have a lot of uh, waste pickers, and these are the informal economy. And, and uh, here, whether the circular economy has the capacity uh, to transform them into, into a formal economy through such mechanism as the cooperatives. So this, this could be, we can, there is a policy instrument, so there is a vacuum, and uh, we can compensate for the losers. But that need a strong political will and integrated policies. Only the environmental policies, only looking at the environmental policies cannot help them. We need an integrated policy framework. And this uh, losers, losers has to be compensated by taking a pie from the winners. Okay. Okay, yes. I, I cannot more than agree with uh, with uh, Paul and 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 um, Ambo. Ambo, sorry, but uh, I would emphasize that, that still we economists should carry out more true cost benefit analysis and focus on distributional issues as well. So there is simply we often stop with the cost benefit analysis, but we do not identify those who are losers and winners. And, and then, of course, the next step is the commitment problem, because we economists tend to emphasize efficiency to policymakers, and then we, we forget that our theorems say that the second welfare theorem says that, that the distribution is equally important to implement this policy. But it's very hard to policymakers to make a commitment if there is any chance that they are punished in the next round when the election is. So I guess that that's the hardest problem in, in, in policy making in the very end. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's a very good question to have this loser and winner. So that's not, it could be loser or winner for the domestic market, it could be also for the international, you know, games. I think uh, especially for them, second economy resource efficiency is very much related, for example, trade, resource trade, and some political issue. So I, our colleagues, they have already said, I think, enough. I just one point, I think, uh, uh, if you like to you know, avoid something happen, it really, I think, cooperation and globalization is very important. As you, you, this moment, especially, you, know, you just mentioned what happened recently, I think. Okay, that's all I would like to say. Okay. Well, um, I think we're, we're just about out of time, so I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for their very interesting presentations and interaction and invite the audience to join me in showing your appreciation. Thank you. And I would invite the panelists now to uh, leave the stage um, for the second panelist to, uh, to join us on the stage. And in particular, I'd like to um, invite my old colleague, Peter Borke, uh, from the OECD. We're going to have a five-minute interlude to talk. Please, I'm inviting yeah, the panelists for the second panel to, uh, to take their seats. But we have a short five-minute intermission where I'm going to have a discussion with, um, with Peter, or rather invite him to say a few words about the work uh, that the OECD is doing in this area. So, yeah, so Peter, you heard the first panel. In the second panel, we'll be going on to um, talk about some of the main obstacles and the policy approaches uh, for how they should be overcome. So, so where is the OECD situated? What are the activities that are you uh, are carrying out to contribute to the analysis um, of this set of issues? Thank you, Brandon. And, uh Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really glad for this opportunity uh, to, to share uh, uh, some information and some insights uh, with you here today. And I was very uh, stimulated by, by the discussion in the panel this, uh, this morning, uh, which I think already brought up uh, many of the, the, the challenges that, that we're facing 
uh, in uh, getting a better handle on uh, the economic consequences uh, of the circular economy. Um, in the OECD, um, our Environmental Policy Committee has really made the circular economy uh, one of its key priorities and uh, very much at the heart of uh, what uh, we will be working on uh, sits this question of what, what are the economic consequences uh, of the circular economy. I think deep down uh, in our guts, uh, especially people like you and me, uh, we, we sort of come from the same community of experts and, and, and policy makers here, uh, we have a sense that this is going to be positive uh, for the economy. But I think, uh, as we've heard already from the panel this morning, we're still sort of missing the really hard evidence uh, that this is so. And um, so, uh, you know, our focus is going to be in contributing to, uh, uh, you know, bringing that, that evidence about. Um, and uh, uh, the, the colleague here um, from uh, 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 Southeast Asia, um, sorry, I cannot pronounce your name, I'm, I'm, I'm not good at this. Um, he, he structured it in, 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 this, in a similar way as we are structuring it. So uh, we're both interested uh, at better understanding uh, the macro level and, and the sort of system-wide uh, um, uh, effects of the circular economy transition, uh, but we're also interested in understanding what happens at the at the micro level and the particular challenges um, that that are occurring there. So uh, at the at the macro level, I think um, what we're now doing is that we're uh, we're identifying a number of weaknesses. Um, uh, and, and opportunities to improve uh, uh, modeling efforts. There have been quite a few modeling efforts uh, already, but if you compare it to uh, climate, economic climate modeling, uh, these efforts remain relatively crude. Um, for instance, uh, you know, models, most macroeconomic models, uh, especially, uh, you know, computable general equilibrium models are currently not able to represent recycling and, 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 and the substitution between primary and secondary. So there are a number of, of areas where we would like to, to move a little bit uh, beyond uh, what's, what's being done uh, currently, and, and, and there are a number of modeling groups uh, uh, in the world which, which are pursuing uh, similar efforts. Um, at, um, uh, at, at, at the micro level, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, looking particularly at uh, uh, the new business models, which uh, are uh, sort of uh, identified, um, but uh, we, uh, we, we are really wondering, uh, and, uh, you know, what, uh, what that means for companies, first and foremost. Um, uh, how is the transition uh, going to play out uh, at the firm level? Um, how are companies going to move from their old business model to a new business model uh, without destroying value uh, and uh, remaining in the market? What does it mean uh, uh, for the scalability um, of uh, these business models? Um, and, and, and also, what does it mean for the environment? Because um, at, at, at the micro level, clearly uh, a switch to business models such as the sharing economy or uh, recycling uh, is obviously going to produce uh, higher levels of resource efficiency and, and some uh, in environmental improvements. Um, but, but how is this playing out uh, then uh, in terms of uh, second order effects at, uh, at a broader scale? Um, so these are some, some of the issues that, that we want to look in. And then finally, uh, we'll also uh, want to look at particular materials. Um, the, the, the problem with the circular economy, which makes it significantly more uh, complex than, than, than climate modeling, for instance, is that you have so many different materials um, uh, that, that, that you potentially need to look at. We want to look at one in particular, which is plastics. Um, uh, which is uh, a massive uh, material flow uh, with very, very low uh, recycling rates at present, and uh, we want to get a, 
uh, a better understanding of what the policies are that can help to uh, improve recycling uh, at that level as well. So uh, ultimately all of that should help us to answer some of the questions uh, that have been raised here by, by the panel on, on, on the distributional impacts, on what's the right policy mix uh, that actually minimizes the transition costs, uh, and, and it should help us to uh, advise governments, uh, hopefully in the most effective way. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that's a, that's a great transition then uh, to the second panel, um, which, is, which is called Taking Science to Practice. So in the first panel, we learned that there are a variety of obstacles uh, to realizing the benefits of a circular economy and that government policies are needed to overcome these obstacles and to reduce the transitional and the other costs. So in this panel, um, we are going to invite the panelists to address two questions. Um, what are the main obstacles to realizing the benefits of the circular economy? And what are, are the most effective policies to overcome these obstacles? Um, and we'd like to conduct uh, the second of the audience polls. So get your uh, phones ready. Um, uh, we've given you a choice of four instruments uh, to promote the circular economy. And if you could only choose one, which would you choose? And you have a choice of four. Uh, environmental taxes, environmental regulation, um, you have investments which could involve investments both from the public sector and policies to encourage investments by the private sector and also innovation. So, so I'll give you, I don't know, 30 seconds or so to, to provide your answers so the panelists will then have the benefits of your views before they make their interventions. So, okay, let's see what the results are. Ah, interesting. So, environmental taxes, uh, a bit less than 40%. Uh, environmental regulation, 26%. Investment, 11, 12%. And innovation, 24%. Very interesting. So, with that as a backdrop, let's turn to the panel. And I'd like to invite uh, first Antonio Gowell, who is the initiative lead on the circular economy at the World Economic Forum based in Geneva. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. So the, the questions that we've been asked is, you know, what, are the, what are the challenges, I suppose, to implement, and, and then therefore, what are the right policy interventions? Um, I suppose the challenge, you know, it, as I see it, of the circular economy concept is that it is really about taking a systems perspective. It's not... A... Can you not hear? Yeah. Is that better? Okay. So the, the key challenge, um, but also opportunity of the circular economy is that it is very much taking a systems perspective. So it's not looking at necessarily any one particular um, dimension, and that forces us to look at the entire kind of value chain or, or system as a whole. And I think the, uh, the interesting thing about that is, is it takes us a little bit out of our perhaps silos that we've been perhaps working on, whether it be looking at particularly energy policy, looking at, for example, water policy, waste management policy as individual areas, but really forcing that cross-collaboration and systems um, look at the, the, the issue at hand. So that for me is kind of the opportunity, but also the, the challenge, um, if you see what I mean. So then the question related to, to the key policy interventions, I suppose coming from the World Economic Forum, um, we very much sit at the interface of the private sector and policymakers. And, and therefore, it is really about thinking through what, what is on one hand the market push, but also the market pull. You know, what can the private sector do? How far can the private sector go? But then at what point do you need policies to intervene to really achieve the scale that's necessary to have that transformative effect on the system at large. Um, so I suppose then taking that, the way that at least I get my head around the circular economy is taking it into specific examples, right? So if you take a value chain, take for example the electronics value chain, you know, if I look at this list of policies behind us, you know, in, in my view, not one individual um, priority policy will necessarily shift the system. You need 
all of them operating at exactly the right points um, and in the right ways within that entire value chain to make things transform. So the electronics value chain, you have design, uh, you have production manufacturing, you have material flows, you have the use of those products, you have the business models that perhaps incentivize the reuse and integration of materials back into a value chain. Design, you know, and, and materials. You know, if you have a company like Apple who's taken a commitment to move towards 100% uh, renewable materials in their production, you know, that in a sense is giving a signal to the market that there will be a demand for those products. What then are perhaps the necessary policies that flow on from that um, to enable the market to provide uh, those materials in a cost-effective way? And then you move to manufacturing. Um, what are, for example, the right uh, you know, policies that you might need in place to actually make the manufacturing processes much more efficient? Um, but also, I think, as the previous speakers alluded to, um, you know, balance the cost, uh, the costs and benefits of doing that in, in the right way. And then similarly, if you move downstream into the, the kind of recycling remanufacturing process, you do get into these significant challenges related to the, the commodities pricing and the markets not necessarily being able to reflect uh, the true cost um, of the materials, whether they be virgin or recycled materials. And that's where you do you know, need to look at some of those broader um, kind of macroeconomic policies to rebalance those costs. So I suppose the, the, the answer is, in a sense, if you look across an entire system, um, you know, you need to look at the, the right policy intervention points to meet, in a sense, some of the private sector kind of leadership and commitments to be able to achieve the scale. Um, I think what we see is a lot of really amazing innovators and large companies taking kind of steps forward, but that's not going to get us as far as we need to go, and that's where you do really need the, the policies to come come into play, and, and at least my argument is that you need all of the all of the <laughs> all of those policies in that list, and and honestly a few more um, to actually make it function um, as a systemic transformation. Great. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's a good um, step into this issue, uh, stressing the complexity of the issue and the need for coherent policy interventions along the value chain. Um, so I'd like to then turn next to our, uh, to our next panelist, um, uh, to Jeremy Waits, the Secretary General of the European Environment Bureau based in Brussels, and the, the EEB is the largest network of environmental NGOs in Europe. So Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brendan, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, well, starting with the obstacles, I think it's quite evident that there's, despite the, the huge kind of win-win-win potential in the circular economy, uh, there's also a huge inertia in the linear economy. Uh, and this inertia is reflected both in the dimension of the business and the producer's uh, side of the equation, uh, but also uh, with, the, with the consumers. Um, looking at the business uh, side, first of all, uh, it's been acknowledged this morning that there are winners and losers. Um, and I think it's not just a matter of saying, well, th th there will be losers. I think we, we need to say there must be losers. I mean, there are certain types of activity that simply cannot be going on uh, in, in one, two, three decades' time if we're going to actually uh, maintain civilization in, in any form uh, that we know it, and uh, referring particularly to the fossil fuel industries. So I think we need a, a much more robust approach in recognizing uh, which are the, the losers and, and having public policies that are, are very clear about that. And that's quite a brutal thing to say, perhaps. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure in the previous panel we'll talk about where we need to compensate losers. Well, there may be a kind of a, a pragmatic... I, I don't want to make this a black and white issue, but I think we, we should question whether we're compensating losers who who've lobbied in a very steadfast way against things that are in the, in the wider public interest. Um, in relation to um, consumers, uh, well, uh, of course, there is sometimes consumer resistance to moving into new patterns, but I also think we should not overstate this uh, because uh, the, the circular economy has an enormous amount to offer to consumers, and it's not, we shouldn't just see this as a kind of a, uh, the circular economy means sacrificed by consumers. In many cases, uh, moving to, for example, leasing models as opposed to ownership models brings huge advantages to consumers who are able to use the, the latest state-of-the-art model, whether it's drilling a hole in their, 
in their, in their basement or, or, or driving uh, a car somewhere uh, instead of their, their old banger which they, they own. So I think there are, there are lots of examples where th there are um, advantages uh, for consumers. Um, another obstacle, um, but perhaps this is looking it, it, it in a backwards way, but that is the, um, the possibility to externalize costs. The fact that that is, is completely uh, possible and allowed and uh, the lack of requirement to internalize costs. Um, and, and finally, in the obstacles, I'd mentioned the lack of a, a shared vision uh, of uh, a, what a circular economy is. And we hear many voices represented in this, in this forum here who all say, well, yes, we believe in the circular economy, but actually some kind of prioritization about that. You hear people from the incineration industry saying, well, we, we believe in a circular economy. We're, we're turning waste into energy, uh, recycling industry, and so on. We need to be clear about our priorities. The Commission that has come with a uh, interesting circular, the European Commission, an interesting circular economy action plan with 54 actions, but not, not very clear prioritization um, about those. So turning to the more interesting part, the solutions. Uh, well, I think the most important ingredient that in a way lies behind all these solutions is political will. Um, and I, I think, you know, unless we acknowledge that um, we are facing on some fronts, uh, and I think particularly of climate change and biodiversity, what is effectively an existential crisis? For other issues, we may be only facing what Paul Eakins referred to as a, a nightmare situation uh, on other issues, but the, these really call for political leadership, and this is what we haven't seen up to now. But turning to the, the four uh, issues listed, um, well, for me, the regulation is the clear number one winner. Why do I say that? because regulation uh, is what can drive the others. Uh, when you, I saw that the majority of the audience uh, voted for, or the largest number uh, voted for uh, environmental taxes. Uh, well, environmental taxes are a particular form of regulation in a way. They're a subset of regulation. They, they need regulation to, to make them work. Um, so maybe that's a little bit, I, I'm cheating a bit there, but I think regulation in a way underlies environmental taxes, but also uh, regulation um, provides the framework uh, within which uh, companies innovate, and what's more, it decides in a way on the direction that they will innovate in. Uh, so having uh, regulations that, um, through environmental taxes, for example, uh, penalize uh, excessive and unnecessary resource consumption or built-in obsolescence or w whatever it is, uh, that can drive uh, the, the behavior of the business sector, in, it can innovate in a certain direction. Uh, and the same applies to investment, of course. I see I'm get, coming close to uh, running out of time, but I, I think what I miss in this list, uh, these four, apart from the, the ingredient of political will, is the dimension of information and awareness, uh, both in the sense of the right to know uh, about products, for example, what kinds of toxic materials are in, in products, uh, or how, how uh, long they're going to last, uh, but also in the sense of education. Um, and I think we do need common standards here, so even here I think regulation is relevant, otherwise you have all the companies making diverse claims with no possibility for the poor consumer to, to decide what's a real claim. So you need some kind of uh, labeling standards um, to, to ensure that there is a, a, common, uh, a, a common platform. Um, and I think um, also in relation to the uh, consumer awareness issues, I think there's huge potential for showing consumers uh, that the circular economy uh, can be something very attractive. This is something that we work on in the EB with our Make Resources Count campaign, also in the area of uh, efficiency of products with our Cool Products campaign. So I think there's, there's a lot we can do and need to do in terms of uh, selling the benefits uh, of, the, of the circular economy to the consumers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, we'll now move on to uh, the third panelist, and I'm pleased to invite Anders Weichmann, who, amongst other things, is the co-president of the Club of Rome and chairman of the Swedish Association of Recycling Industries. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me say that 
I'm a bit intrigued by the previous question, is a move towards a circular economy, is it good for the economy? Uh, I mean, you have to be an absolute, I would say, idiot if you don't see the benefits of moving towards enhanced resource efficiency. We, 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 can just, we, can just look at, we can just look at climate change, where material use is a significant part of the challenge. We have concentrated all our attention on, on energy systems, for good reasons. But the other side of the coin is material use. Cement, steel, aluminium make up roughly 20% of carbon emissions. And we know that infrastructure is expanding all over the world. We, will, we may double or triple or quadruple uh, infrastructure and, and the demand for these materials in the coming decades if we don't do this in a different way. We can't forget about the Paris Agreement. So, so that whole discussion is, to me, not really the one we should have. Because if we don't move in this direction, we will all be losers. We will live on a planet where business is going to more or less cease to exist. So what, what, what we are confronted is, is a major transformation. And that's why this is difficult. Because we have to challenge most of the frameworks of the economy. And we have gone from being a small population, a small economy on a very big planet, and we are now an increasingly and rapidly increasing economy and, and also population on a smaller and smaller planet. And, and that requires a different logic. And the fact that we could use nature without any cost until now is, of course, the main problem. So the barriers to change are, of course, the cost structure is flawed. The whole economy is extremely short-term in nature. And the way we tax labor vis-a-vis -vis nature is absurd. In my country, 60% of tax income comes from taxing labor. 5% comes from taxing energy and nature. So no wonder we are where we are. There are some very distinctive barriers to change. One is that virgin materials most often are less expensive than secondary materials. I know it because I'm, I'm in the recycling industry part of my time. So the secondary materials market doesn't really function. Of course, it differs from different sectors, but, but in general, this is a problem. Secondly, it doesn't help to enhance re recycling rates unless what we recycle, what we collect, can have a second life. Take plastics, for instance. There are so many different varieties. So once we have collected it, the only way to deal with it is to downcycle. It ends up in, in flooring or some rather trivial, trivial applications, not in high quality applications. Thirdly, it's very beneficial all over Europe for municipalities to incinerate waste to produce energy. It's a win-win for, for many municipalities. And as long as this is the case, it's a serious barrier to change. And large, largely, large, lastly but not the least, uh, we don't look at what values that are being lost the way we, we, we manage materials. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation a few years ago made an estimate that 95% of the values of materials are being lost from first cycle of use to second cycle. So it's not only that we are polluting the earth, we are also throwing away a lot of value. Now what do we do? Firstly, tax reform, a general tax reform. Reduce taxes on labor, increase taxes or, or charges on the use of nature. Secondly, we need design requirements. We shouldn't be able to put onto the market things that con cannot be easily recycled or reused. And the electronic sector is a perfect example. I'm happy about Apple's uh, new announcement, but for decades they did nothing. It was, it was not even possible to change the battery in your laptop. Give me a break. And that's why the only thing that is being recycled, if anything, or equally, is, is copper and gold. All the rest is not, is not recycled. 
Thirdly, we need standards in many areas. The, the construction sector is a perfect example. Uh, fourthly, we need to st stimulate sustainable innovation. Research programs in most universities, in most research supporting programs from, from the public sector, are not geared towards sustainable innovation. And that is a key, because we need leapfrogging, we need real, real transformation in, in many, many areas. Finally, public procurement is very important. It makes up almost 20% of the economy in most, uh, in most countries in the world. If public procurement is used wisely, it can help encourage demand for, for, for the circular economy uh, as a concept. I should add, of course, material use has to be a main priority in climate policy making. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anders, for those forthright views. I'm sure uh, that will stimulate some further thought and further discussion. Um, now I'd like to turn to the fourth panellist, to Scott Vaughan, uh, who's the president and CEO of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, and he's based in, Winni yes, in Winnipeg, uh, yes, in Canada. The floor is yours. Good. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me first by saying thank you and congratulations to CITRA. This has been an extraordinary two days. Um, I think this is the moment to talk about the circular economy, and so the leadership of CITRA is, is really remarkable, and so I, I thank you and congratulate you. I, I wanted to make three very brief points about obstacles, and it just resonates or magnifies what we've heard from the, this panel and the previous panel. So I, I see three obstacles, uh, and I'll go through each. So one is GDP. Uh, the second is what we don't know about jobs and labor markets. And the third is around fiscal policy coherence. So, so the first, when you think about circular economy, uh, we think about efficiency gains leading to savings. Uh, we think about sharing. Uh, we think about avoided environmental degradation, environmental destruction, environmental costs, uh, as well as social equity. And, and GDP as a measure that uh, we heard from Paul earlier, uh, if a politician watches one indicator, it will be what is the rate of GDP growth on a quarterly or an, a an annual basis. And the problem is that GDP doesn't care about savings. GDP was, was created um, in order to measure income. And that's sort of a shortcut of what, what GDP is. There's lots of different moving parts of it. Um, and economic modelers can go and say, what is the savings at the company level, at the country level, at the economy-wide economy level from using circular economy, and then making assumptions about what would be the reinvestment from those savings that would lead to an income flow. But, but we're going, you know, the, the economic analysis becomes uh, circular and complex and non-transparent. And so what we've been doing, and you're also seeing it now because of the sustainable development goals, but also because uh, of the crisis of which we're all here, uh, we're on, nowhere on a pathway to meeting the Paris goal of well below two degrees Celsius. We're nowhere in a pathway to ensuring food security uh, in the next 50 years because of global water scarcity, both on groundwater uh, and freshwater contamination, surface water, et cetera, forestry destruction, et cetera. And, and you we're living in two different worlds, uh, looking at the, the updates on what is the next global uh, indicator of ecological collapse, and at the same time, having financial analysts stressing out about not meeting GDP goals. There's been a lot of work for the last 30 years on, on beyond GDP. And, and what I'm excited about is saying that this obstacle now uh, is being overcome by an increasing body of work that's going, looking at work on beyond GDP. And, and my colleagues in the International Institute of Sustainable Development, we released a report in late uh, 2016 drawing upon the work of uh, Cambridge economists uh, Gastup Gupta and Robert Rapetto and others. And, and we said, look, GDP is important, but it's not going to capture the things that we're trying to do with the circular economy. Mm -hmm. So we looked at it for Canada. We looked at the four pillars of what constitutes wealth from a country perspective, mm -hmm. human capital, natural resource capital, produced capital, and social capital. And what that said is the GDP indicators for Canada and for all OECD countries are moving upwards, but GDP doesn't care what happens the next quarter. And so what we said, looking at it from statisticians that come from our uh, statistical agency, is that Canada's wealth 
and, and many other countries, you can extrapolate from this, has been built, built upon drawing down on our natural capital over a 30-year period by 25%. Um, and, and so that saying, let's look at different instruments, not to replace, but to complement GDP, or otherwise we're going to be living in these two estranged divorce worlds. The second one I wanted to briefly touch upon is jobs. I, I shouldn't have watched Donald Trump last week, but I did. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else in this room watched the whole speech. But Donald Trump's entire speech could have been written in the 1970s, which said, if you take an environmental regulation, there will be job losses. So he didn't talk about what are the costs of inaction on climate change. He didn't talk about what are the benefits on creation of new jobs and new markets. And he didn't look at the benefits in terms of avoiding emissions. Um, and so I think we need to look at this jobs urgency with, with absolute urgency. And, and one part of that is we're seeing work from the European Commission, from Ella MacArthur, from, from others, and, and also from OECD. I think it's important we get now to the national statistical agencies to say, let's, um, Eurostat and others, to say we need to have a, a systematic um, assessment of what are the job effects of circular economy, particularly for developing countries. And, and the last one I would just say is on fiscal policy. Um, I, I think what's important is not only the design of the fiscal instrument, but I think more importantly is the level of ambition. Um, and, and the second part which our colleague from Indonesia talked about is policy coherence. We're seeing now uh, carbon pricing, but at the same time, we have almost $500 billion that governments are spending yearly on subsidizing fossil fuels. So it's moving downwards, but, but we need to get coherence in terms of our fiscal responses. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes left uh, for discussion, and I thought maybe what we might do is um, ask to have the, the results of the audience poll put back up, um, and maybe um, invite the panelists, those who haven't already uh, had the chance to react to, to those results, um, to, to, to ask them whether um, they're what they expected, um, uh, <coughs> I mean, or not, and if not, why not? So. Uh, we saw uh, that roughly 40% of you uh, thought that environmental taxes uh, was the most important. We've already had some discussion about that and the difficulties, the political economy, challenges that are involved in implementing environmental taxes. Um, uh, strong support also for regulation, and uh, it was Jeremy who was a strong advocate of that approach. Um, yes, investment, 10%. Uh, Yes, an innovation, 23, 24%, but yet you know, different people have stressed the importance of innovation. And of course, we, we should recognize um, that it's not either or. We, we pose this question to you to, to, to stimulate some discussion, and in fact, it's clear from the discussion that you need a mix of policy instruments that are coherent along value chains and supply chains. So, um, uh, uh, you know, that's important to bear in mind. So, Maybe the panel might wish to, to react to this. Uh, yes, I see Anders has indicated. <clears throat> yes, first of all, um, I think Antonia uh, put it very right. We need a systems approach because it's a system we are, are dealing with. Uh, and I, I would say if I compare the knowledge among policymakers when it comes to energy policymaking mm. to encourage both energy efficiency and renewables, we have had debates now for 20 years. And we have developed policy instruments that have been tested, feed-in tariffs, green certificates, different labels, etc. So we know more or less what works. In the circular economy context, and, and by the way, there is no clear definition of a circular economy, it's, it's many things. But I would say ignorance is very, very large. Uh, most policymakers don't, don't really understand what is at stake. And when I listen to the debate, for instance, in the Swedish parliament or the European parliament, everybody seems to be happy as long as they can enhance recycling rates. Mm -hmm. Then we're done. I mean, of course it's not true. And, and I gave some examples why this is not true. So uh, I think we need to, to inform policymakers the, 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 the complexity of, of the problem, 
and also that we need this systems approach. And, and everything here, plus a number of other things, uh, have, to, have to be put in play. And of course, in, in, in some areas, unless we have innovation, this is going to be more or less impossible. In other areas, it, it is primarily a question of getting the prices right. In yet other areas, it's a question of regulation and maybe also banning certain things. So there is not one answer. Uh, and that's why these kind of gallops or polls are, are, are not always, give not always the, 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 the accurate answer. Sure. Thank you. Yes, Antonia. Um, I think perhaps just picking up on the innovation point. Can you hear me? Is it working? Um, I mean, one one thing that you know at the forum we spend quite a lot of time thinking about right now is is uh, something that our chairman coined as the fourth industrial revolution. Is there is a whole innovation transformation happening all around us that we're all part of at the moment, be it digitization, be it new technologies, artificial intelligence, three D printing, kind of all these things that we sort of hear about, perhaps fear a little bit, but also see as incredible opportunities. Um, and I think you know as we look at um, you know and as as governments look at how do we really leverage these new innovations to support and enable this circular economy transformation, but also new approaches to natural resource governance, natural resource management using big data and all these different approaches is, is in a sense perhaps what will enable us to kind of um, step change into uh, really applying and scaling some of these these issues, and I suppose you know as we look at uh, the policy dimensions, you know one of the the questions in a sense is, you know what what how are policymakers really going to play into that space in the context of the circular economy, which is one that is moving at light speeds faster than any of us can really comprehend in a sense. Um, so maybe it's, it's just kind of maybe a new dimension to the discussion, but I think it's one that's really important for us not to forget because it's something um, that if we, we don't either tap into or really leverage to the benefit of this transformation, we will be really missing out um, significantly on, on a huge amount of potential. But we still need the right policy structures, governance structures, frameworks around that to make sure that it contributes to the circular economy transformation um, and to the benefit of the environment at large, because it's not a given necessarily as well. Yeah. So whatever policy instruments and approaches we're using, an important factor should be to drive innovation and to, and to harness these new technologies which are uh, transforming industrial processes and practices. Yeah. So Jeremy, you want to add something? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, first of all, just to clarify my earlier comments, I mean, I, I'm very happy to see the level of support for environmental taxes uh, because I do see that as an example of a regulatory approach. Uh, so you could say there's kind of 65%, if you like, support for a regulatory approach in one, one way or another. Uh, but, I mean, in, in terms of regulation, which isn't about regulating uh, f fiscal uh, matters, um, then, I mean, I think there's a huge uh, role there uh, an important role in relation to wh whichever part of the circular economy cycle uh, you look at. Uh, in relation to product design, I mean, we should remember that 80% uh, of the environmental impact of, of products on average is determined during the, the design stage. Uh, so this is a hugely important part of the cycle. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong in this day and age saying there are certain types of product which are so inefficient in terms of the energy consumption, for example, uh, it, that, that they should simply be banned. And that's what we have started to do in Europe with the eco-design uh, directive. We start to phase out the, the most inefficient uh, ones. Uh, at the, at the, uh, the leading end of the spectrum, uh, we reward with the eco-label schemes uh, those leaders in industry. And in all the range in between, uh, we insist on information, we have labeling standards which ena enable the, the consumer to, to actually know what the energy consumption is of a product. We need to extend that into the, into the resource consumption more generally. At the moment, the focus up to now, the focus has been very much on energy, but we need to look at the, uh, the broader uh, focus. And this goes to the issue of consumer choice, because people often think, well, regulation is about limiting it's about limiting consumer choice. But I don't see it that way when you, come to, when you think about uh, consumers uh, wanting to know uh, what the, uh, product, the, uh, the uh, f environmental footprint of a product is. 
uh, then regulation can help them to make a more informed choice. Um, and I do think in relation to the question of uh, limiting the choices of the, the business sector to do what it wants, I think it would be very helpful and healthy if the, the leaders in the business community, the champions of the circular economy, would be more outspoken in pushing for uh, a, a regulatory approach, a stronger regulatory approach, rather than just saying, well, we're happy because we're getting on and doing it anyway, and then forgetting about the laggards, I think it would be more healthy to, for those leaders to say, no, we need to take responsibility for the way the business sector as a whole is lobbying in these processes. For example, right now in the waste legislation uh, that's being discussed uh, in the EU, uh, among the EU institutions, uh, and I think the business community, the leaders in the business community, need to take responsibility for their whole sector. I know that's a difficult one because there are different interests, as we've said, but I, I do think uh, it would be very good uh, to, to see that. I completely agree with Alice's comment about the uh, green public procurement. I mean, this se seems like the low-hanging fruit, an easy win, uh, mm -hmm. and how disappointing, uh, how little progress we've made on this. Um, and, and wouldn't it be easier to hear, again, as an example of taking... Uh, a, a more tough regulatory approach, uh, even at the EU level in the case of Europe, uh, but at national level, it's also open to governments to do this. This is something they can, uh, that, that's very much within their control. Thank you. Okay. You had a very yeah. short intervention. Can I just <clears throat> add one thing? Because I've been reviewing public procurement a couple of years ago, and one of the key problems is, on the one hand, this idea within the European Union, if we look at Europe, that we should have equal, comp we should have um, competition across borders. Uh, so it's impossible for a public agency to give a special favor to a company they know that has an environmentally benign offer. Uh, you cannot disclose anybody, uh, exclude anyone to start with, which makes it quite difficult. Secondly, the competences among procurers, those who, who deal with it in daily life, is not at the level which would be required. So, so we have a, a number of issues here. We have sort of formally legal issues, how, how, how the legislation uh, looks like. Which could be a reason to deal with it at EU level. Exactly, well. but yeah. then you have the competences mm -hmm. and also the fact that anybody who offers a lower bid than what you have done in terms of uh, cost always have an advantage when, whenever uh, the thing is brought to a court. So, so it's, it's a very complex issue, but I, but I agree with you, we, we, could, we, we could fix it. Okay. S Scott? Yeah, very, very, very briefly, um, I, I'll, I'll want to just say a word on the one that got the least votes, which is investment. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of you followed the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative Forum that the Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted uh, about two weeks ago in Beijing. But within that, the, the, the vision is very much sort of the first part of it is infrastructure. And, and now with 68, 69 countries, so it's related to procurement is what will the next generation of infrastructure looks, look like? And that's going to be $60 trillion that governments and the private sector are going to be investing in infrastructure in, in globally, but the Belt and Road will be a main driver of this. So President Xi Jinping mentioned the circular economy at being at the, at the heart of that initiative. So, you know, let's wait and see what that looks like. But, but if you're looking at that $60 trillion, so part of it is what type of, of materials will be used? Can we, we, are there now substitutes of low carbon and, and different composite materials? But also, are we building infrastructure for the 20th century? Are we building now infrastructure <coughs> in order to, to, to advance and, and, uh, and, and accelerate the, the shared economy moving forward? So I think this investment part of it is, yeah. you know, what's with the blended finance coming out of the Addis Summit, but also uh, we're seeing now, and we heard this morning from ING, the private sector financial markets are now believing this is real, uh, but they're not believing it enough. Okay, thank you very much. I think that concludes our panel discussion, and I'd ask you to join me in showing your appreciation to the panelists. Um, I've been asked to try and sum up and to give a few um, of the key messages that have come out of this session, so let me try to do that very briefly before lunch. 
Um, I think maybe the overarching uh, conclusion is that um, there are important potential benefits in the transition to a circular economy, but they're not going to be generated automatically by, by, by markets, uh, but they need um, uh, the actions of governments to implement efficient and effective policies to overcome a range of different barriers. Um, further work is needed uh, to refine the models to provide policymakers with more robust analysis of the macroeconomic impact of the transition uh, uh, to a circular economy. Um, further analysis is also needed at the micro level, but, you know, particularly on the business models that can facilitate the transition uh, 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 to a circular economy. We discussed a lot too about distributional impacts both within countries and, and, and also between countries um, and the need uh, for more work on this. Um, and I think an important point that came out was that it's not just looking at the losers and, and at compensation, but also that it's actually necessary uh, that some firms and activities close down and perhaps we should also be looking at how to facilitate the exit of firms or sectors uh, from, 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 from the economy. In terms of policies, um, I think it was clear that there's no one-size-fits-all approach uh, um, to deal with the problems uh, and the challenges of resource efficiency. Um, an important prerequisite that was emphasized by many um, is the need for political will um, and the need to uh, tailor um, the, uh, the, specific, um, the, the specific policies to address the challenges that occur in different sectors and in different locations. These are all, these are all quite different. Uh, generally, there'll be a need uh, for a mix of policies that need to provide appropriate incentives um, throughout value chains um, and to adopt a systems approach. Um, there's a need for both a supply side and a, de and, and a demand side approach, as we just heard um, in terms of public procurement. And, and the policy instruments, as far as possible, should be designed so as to stimulate innovation, which is clearly going to be key in the transition uh, to a circular economy. Um, and finally, um, there's a need to develop um, uh, some better indicators to, to track this transition to a circular economy. Um, we've been talking about, you know, the beyond GDP and, uh, you know, capturing well-being, but also to have uh, some better measures of employment and how uh, the structure of the, of the economy is changing and evolving in line with the objectives of the circular economy. Um, so with that, let me uh, conclude this session. Um, let me again thank all of the panellists, all the speakers, and to um, thank you for your engagement and your participation, your feedback uh, through the opinion polls. Um, and I believe lunch is now being served outside. So enjoy your lunch. Thank you.